Hi again, everybody. It's Jeremy Boren. I'm uh, Gray Matters brand manager. I want to welcome you today. Thanks for uh, being on time. Some of you logged in early. So we have a great group of people and have a really cool presentation today from Ed Goodson and Ken Latino. We're going to be talking about predictive analytics and also asset performance management. So, uh, so thanks for logging on. And uh, as we go along, uh, if you have questions during the conversation, and, and please do ask questions, uh, you can type them into the chat window on GoToWebinar. Um, I'll be able to check them out. And if it's about something that Eric and Ken are discussing at that moment, I can, uh, I can slip it in during their presentation. Um, also, we'll have time for questions and answers at the end. And um, for those wondering, we will be able to, uh, to make a copy of the presentation available at a later date. So, so thanks for joining us um, today with Gray Matter. Uh, Eric is a uh, paper industry veteran. He essentially wrote the GE Prophecy MES and GE Historian that a lot of you are running in your plants. And Eric's going to talk to us about predictive analytics and machine learning. And it's going to be in the context of the pulp and paper industry, but his presentation and Ken's too really applies to a lot of different types of manufacturers and industries that Gray Matter works with, like food and beverage, oil and gas, water utility, consumer packaged goods, to, to name a few of them. So if you're not directly in the paper, pulp and paper industry, don't worry. There's, there's plenty of stuff here for you, I promise. Uh, Ken Latino also has a really deep background in the paper industry. I uh, worked at Westrock for, for nine years, and Ken is a reliability expert at Gray Matter, and he's going to talk to us about uh, asset performance management or APM, how you can make sure you have an APM solution that can um, you know predict a potential problem uh, or also turn into an alert that you can actually you know create a work process around so that you can uh, address it. So like I said, uh, if you're just signing on, uh, you can type questions into the little dialog box. I'll see them. I'll be able to pose them to Eric and then Ken. We'll also have some time at the end for uh, question and answers today. So with that, I'd like to uh, introduce Eric Goodston. Eric, take it away. Thanks, Jeremy, and welcome, everyone, uh, to our session today. As uh, as Jeremy mentioned, I actually started my career in the pulp and paper industry way back in 1988. I, I worked on a paper machine startup for Champion Paper up in uh, Quinnipiac, Michigan, and had, had a rare opportunity to put in some of the latest technology at that point in time. That, uh, ironically, uh, I, I was able to implement some um, predictive analytics and machine learning technology way back at that time that uh, demonstrated some success. And that technology has come an extraordinary distance in the last, in the last 30 years. And I'm, I'm really excited to tell you about the latest and greatest and, and what's, what's possible today. So first of all, um, staying competitive in, in, the, in any industry really is about Attracting talent, technical talent, retaining domain expertise that you built up over, over decades, and learning faster, acting faster than the competition. And this is something that uh, companies that we work with are faced with um, every single day, asking how do they attract the smartest engineers and technical people, how do they keep the domain expertise that they have, and all, all of this talent wants to be using the latest and greatest tools and the latest and greatest technology to, so that they can make the, the biggest impact. And so our perspective of, of predictive analytics, it's, it's about putting this learning technology in, in place that is a force multiplier for your domain experts to make improvement actions uh, in, the, in the mill and, and to do that on a continuous basis. So we've seen an evolution of the operating models and the control models uh, over the years. And I, I started off in the paper industry, but over the years have had pretty wide exposure to many industries and have seen this evolution of, of control and op operating models happen in multiple industries where 
in the beginning, the process control systems, uh, such as you might find on a DCS on a paper machine, for example, was the, the initial focus. And then the, the focus after that technology became sort of uh, common. The next was to put in the mill-wide information systems and the sort of the plant-wide view really focused on problem solving across the plant. And then today it's really about having uh, an operation center view where you're looking at multiple plants and being able to apply optimization across, across many plants potentially all at the same time. And this is something I, I, I actually saw happening in the power generation industry first, and then next it started to happen within the oil and gas industry. And today this is something that's becoming common across many, many industries as the technology that enables it becomes better and better. And one thing I, I'm pretty confident in is that within the paper industry, the data is there. Uh, we've been putting historians and uh, MES and other uh, information systems in place for decades now, and, and the information exists. The real question is, what are you doing to leverage that information and uh, to, to optimize your, your uh, operations across, really, the enterprise? So what we do at TwinThread is we have a system that, that connects your assets, teams, uh, all your internal systems with predictive models that the predictive models really serve two purposes. One is to accelerate your learning. Um, and then the second is to automate critical processes. So an example of accelerating learning might be um, you, you have a certain type of downtime that's occurring across multiple paper machines, across multiple mills, and you want to understand what's driving it. And so that's one use of the predictive model is to give you insights, non-obvious insights about what the causes of those, of the downtime or sheet breaks and such are about. An example of automating a critical process is Let's say that uh, the models reveal that um, a particular piece of equipment is, is a, a common cause of, of downtime when it's uh, wearing out or, or whatnot. And automating a process of either producing a work order to repair it or automating a process to uh, trigger um, a work process that, that Ken will talk about within APM a little bit later, is an example of automating a process using the learning that's coming out of, uh, of a predictive model. So what TwinThread does is we create what we call Smart Operations Center by, by first creating digital twins of each of your assets. And the digital twin is, is kind of the, the digital representation of your physical assets and connecting them with what we call digital threads or predictive models that describe how those particular pieces of equipment operate. And by using predictive algorithms and the scalability of the cloud, this is a tool set that your domain experts can use to apply their expertise uh, very quickly across the enterprise. And it's really the only practical way to have let's say, a, a single domain expert working across many, many processes and being able to do that efficiently is to use automated algorithms to really uh, boost their capability in, in what they do. A couple things that we think make our approach different about how we're applying predictive analytics. Uh, one is, is that the team that we put together here has deployed these systems in many industries, pulp and paper included, on well over uh, $400 billion worth of assets over the last 20, 25 years. And with that, from the technology perspective, we've really learned what are the practical applications of artificial intelligence and machine learning. There's, there's a lot of hype in this space today about what can be done, and we've really learned the the practical
practical ways of applying it, things that can deliver benefit today and aren't just a research project. And the last point here in our differences is about scalability. And, and this is about making the economics of a solution like this work on a relatively inexpensive asset, let's say $300 asset, all the way up to a very expensive asset that might be $100 million. And today we're, we're monitoring almost a million assets that fall uh, all across that range of very inexpensive to, to expensive assets. And the common theme that we work with customers around is, is this idea that there is a, typically a very high variation in performance across similar assets within the, within the company. And naturally, there's some assets that don't perform that well, and then there's some assets that perform okay, and then there's a, another set of assets which perform very well. And the key question is, what differentiates? Why do the best assets perform the best? And why do the worst performing assets perform the worst? And in understanding and getting that insight, and getting that learning, uh, there is a tremendous uh, potential payback. It's not necessarily about taking your assets and making them perform at a level they have never ever performed at or that uh, no other similar asset has demonstrated it's possible. It's really about reducing the overall variation of the performance of the assets at a higher average level. And through that, that, that delivers payback. And so with uh, Twin Thread and Predictive Analytics, we're providing a very systematic approach, an algorithm-based approach to scale your domain expertise across many, many assets and allow you to reduce the overall variation and performance in a number of dimensions, whether that be efficiency, quality, uh, potentially even, even safety. What this looks like to a domain expert is what you're seeing uh, on the screen at the moment. Um, this is a dashboard that's, that's really designed for a, a domain expert that is responsible maybe for a certain type of equipment or a certain section of the process. Maybe they're the, they're the senior process engineer that's really the expert in uh, wet-end performance on a paper machine. So the aim of this dashboard is to allow them to see all the paper machines across the company and how they sit in this dimension of performance utilization or or really whatever metric you're defining as, as the key metric for how those assets are performing, to get a bird's eye view of that and understand what is the distribution of performance across all of, all of my machines and um, which ones are the performing the best and to try to understand why they're performing the best and also what are the common problems that are happening across that fleet of assets uh, that uh, are, how are they trending? How are those common problems trending? So that as the, as the expert in that part of the process, I know where to focus my domain expertise, I know where to solve the problems. And this is what this dashboard is really intended to do. So I'm gonna walk through a couple specific um, predictive monitoring use cases. Um, within TwinThread we cover two some important domains, one being the operations domain and uh, monitoring things that relate to operations, and the other is the maintenance domain, which is uh, really very asset-centric and uh, monitoring the, the performance of, and condition uh, of assets. I'm going to focus on two use cases in the operations domain, and then I'm going to transition it to Ken, who is going to talk uh, in more detail about some of the maintenance domain and, and really taking actions on a lot of the, what uh, the analytics would produce in that, in that maintenance domain. So within the operations domain, uh, the way I like to describe this is if you were to uh, develop a Pareto chart or a pie chart of your top downtime reasons on, let's say, all of your paper machines, um, that's going to break down between operations-related reasons and
and maintenance related and equipment related reasons. And often uh, the operations related reasons really dominate that pie chart. And the, the, the goal here of the predictive analytic is to first understand what's driving those uh, operations and then second, put in predictive monitoring to help potentially prevent issues. So the first case we're gonna look at here is, is in the predict, prevent, downtime uh, use case area. We support other areas like predict quality and anomaly detection and optimizing material usage as other predictive monitoring use cases. But today we're gonna to drill into two of those, which is the predict, prevent downtime and the uh, energy efficiency use case. So let's take a look at this uh, predict and prevent downtime use case. And um, what I've chosen here is, let's say it's very specific use case around sheet breaks on a paper machine. And there's two, two aspects of, the, of what we want to get from the, the modeling and uh, applying machine learning here. One is to understand the top drivers of what's causing breaks on the machine so that we can potentially formulate long-term actions, whether those be maintenance actions or whether those be um, recipe or set point setting. Um, or whether they be uh, process process changes to to alleviate whatever those those causes are. The other goal is short term actions, where when we have an accurate predictive model, it could potentially give us advanced warning that the conditions are reaching the point where a sheet break is imminent, and if we get enough advanced warning, we can take immediate action to avert that sheet break. And this is a very common uh, use case, very common scenario where we have these long-term actions that we would take based on the predictive model and the, and the short-term actions. So the way this process works is really starting with uh, connecting the digital twins. And, and this is where a model of the different pieces of equipment that, that make up the paper machine are, are modeled. And um, the data is, is typically collected from, let's say, the, the plant historian or uh, potentially uh, the plant MES system. And in, in less often, it involves maybe connecting directly to the control system if, if you don't have a historian or if you don't have uh, other, other systems that, are, that have been collecting the data. One of the reasons why we like to start with a historian if it's available is that uh, right after connecting, you have many months, potentially many years of data available that are gonna make the training of the models that much more robust out of the gate. If that history doesn't exist, then we start collecting it and we have to wait typically two to three months or more before we built up enough data to be able to train this model. So after connecting to the digital twins and getting the data, we, we train the models. And uh, I'll describe it in a moment here, but we have what we call the model factory, which is a digital assembly line for automating the, the training and production of models. And I'll, I'll drill into that in a little bit more in a moment, but this is an automated process where once the digital twins are created, the process of training the models is, is automated. And out of, uh, out of that process comes trained models that um, are useful to interrogate and analyze to understand what are the top reasons for, for breaks according to the data. What are the best recipe centerline set points that are that potentially could be used to reduce the risk of breaks and I'll drill into that as well in a moment and then sometimes out of these models it will reveal opportunities to 
either tune controls or, or rethink certain control strategies based off of what the model is identifying as this top, the top brake drivers. And again, these are long-term actions. They're not something that someone is going to uh, run out and change something immediately. These are, these are more planful, planful things that, that happen over the long term. And so that's the analysis step. The next step is to deploy those models so that they're operating in real time against the digital twins. And with that model deployed, we can monitor it and use the information the model is producing to feed to engineers and operators to give them a real-time look at what are the top anomalies that are occurring right now that are leaning you towards a higher risk of heat breaks. And by understanding those anomalies and, and working proactively to reduce those anomalies, it, it reduces the overall risk of breaks, sometimes eminently. Um, sometimes the real-time anomalies are require urgent action to avert uh, uh, a sheet break. And we have the, the uh, interface, if you will, to, to, to use within the operations environment to, to, to apply that. And so we have this end-to-end -end process that's connecting the digital twins with the digital thread, which are the trained models, and uh, using the output of those models to, to take both long-term and and short-term actions. Uh, something I mentioned before was this model factory. Um, and we created this model factory to, to really solve a what we see as a significant problem. Um, all companies have, have um, domain experts in certain aspects of, of your process. And those domain experts are Typically, uh, very good engineers, potentially very good at um, using Excel, for example, but not necessarily data scientists that have the background and expertise to, to perform very detailed uh, machine learning, analytic building data science. So we created this model factory to automate that process. Of, of taking data, filtering it, transforming it, training models, and then uh, managing those models in a, in a very automated way. And we like to call this a digital assembly line because it's not just about creating one model. It's really about creating a repeatable process that can create um, accurate models at scale. And put that tool in the hands of a domain expert who can use this and create models and deploy them and do that very easily without necessarily having data science expertise. Now, if you have data scientists and they do have expertise, it just makes this even better because this automates the process that data scientists would typically do manually. And um, this is a key really to scaling from having models that work on one asset to having models that work well across potentially hundreds if not thousands of assets. And this is an important component. Um, around that cheap break scenario, I mentioned the concept of, of setting center lines or set points that reduce the overall risk of breaks. And one of the outputs of the models, really I like to call it the exhaust of the modeling process, is a lot of very detailed analysis about what's going on on the machine and what's contributing to breaks. And what this, what this view represents is, if, if we just follow kind of the blue line, this represents what you would probably expect to be a normal distribution of, of values representing some operating parameter. Let's say this is a, uh, a, uh, a slice vacuum on a paper machine. And you would expect that if you're running a certain product at a certain speed, that in general, the, the control system 
and the operators are maintaining that particular parameter at a specific value, and you'd expect there's a normal curve around it. But as we look at this example, instead of having one uh, hump in the normal curve, there's actually one, two, three, four humps in the normal curve that really represent four different operating modes that that particular parameter is being operated in. And in many cases, people don't really even understand that those four operating modes exist. They assume that the machine is being run to the set point, to the recipe, controlled to that. Well, in this case, there's four. And when we look at it from a risk perspective of where breaks occur and where breaks aren't occurring, what you see is, is that not all of those operating modes have equal risk of of breaks. And if everything else is equal, choosing an operating mode that minimizes the risk of breaks versus choosing an operating mode that, that has proven higher risk of breaks, of course you're going to choose the operating mode that has a lower risk of breaks. And so one of the, one of the um, outputs of the model is to apply this principle across potentially thousands of parameters, hundreds of control loops, thousands of parameters, and really isolate where is the safest range to operate in. And again, where it's, where it's equal, let's say to quality or to other aspects of uh, runnability on the machine, why not choose the lowest risk one? And uh, we give you a tool to really identify that quickly. And, and potentially it means that you, you may not change your set points or your recipes, but maybe you tighten the ranges that you allow uh, maybe the operator discretion within to a tighter range that, that has demonstrated to be safe in, in terms of the op operating conditions. This next view, and I apologize, I'm, I've redacted out some of the information on this just to uh, protect the innocent. Um, this is from a real customer that, that uh, is looking at the real-time output of one of these uh, break prediction models, and uh, this is an example of what you get from that. This is really highlighting the top anomalies that are happening right now, actually highlighted by this uh, yellow time period in the trend, um, where in this particular case, um, we know that what was happening was they uh, started doing a product change over a great change and did not uh, let's say gracefully make the changes and as a result um, a lot of anomalies start showing up when parameters start moving outside of their normal band. The normal band would be represented by the green here and you can see where it's been highlighted in several cases things are falling outside of the band they're expected to as this transitions through a, through a product change. and. Um, by seeing these anomalies real time, you, you have an opportunity to react um, in, in enough time to correct things, potentially before it causes a, a break or, or some other problem in the, in the process. And uh, this is updated you know, real time along, along with uh, um, all the data that's, that's, that's feeding in, into this. And so here's an example of, a, of the short term um, things that can come from uh, using a predictive model to, to predict breaks. So that, that is the um, predict break or predict, predict downtime use case kind of laid out in different parts. The next use case I'd like to talk a little bit about is, is about energy consumption. And, and this, is, this is a lot about prediction um, and being able to predict what, what your top energy drivers are going to be, but it's also about get, gaining a deeper understanding, uh, not in a predictive or forward-looking sense, but a deeper understanding in a, in a backward-looking sense of what's driving your, your energy, energy costs and what operating modes or what products potentially are, are having an unusual high energy consumption uh, or what, what, what practices are, are driving certain certain energy uses. So here again, with this with this particular case, it starts with 
modeling the digital twins and connecting to the data and training the models. And one point I would make about training the models is it's, it's often the case that you cannot measure, you want to be able to measure energy at a pretty low resolution in the, in the plant. And you might not have metering, substation metering for, for power, or uh, you may not have any meters. And, and one of the roles of, of applying the predictive analytics is, is to create software sub-metering. It's really a way of systematically taking an energy consumption measurement that at one point in the process and using a, a predictive algorithm to split that up across multiple sub pieces of equipment or sub parts of the process in a logical way so that you have a good measurement. It's not a direct measurement of energy consumption. It's more of a software measurement of energy consumption, but nonetheless, it is important to do to be able to um, be able to slice and dice energy usage in all the ways that you want to slice it. And on top of that, you want to be able to look at things by product, by production, in other contexts that really help you understand the full, full context of, of energy consumption. And that all goes into this training step of, of training the models. Now, similar to um, the, the break prediction, after producing a model, there's, again, a lot of useful information that comes out of, of a trained predictive model, like what are your top drivers for energy? Um, and, and normally that's not a huge surprise, but sometimes after applying the sub-metering concept that, that I just talked about, there are some surprises in, in what's driving energy usage. That can be best best set points. What's the normal settings for things that, that, um, that minimize energy usage or what's the normal, normal settings that, that are associated with normal energy usage. And then there are some other opportunities that typically come out of this step, such as uh, automation opportunities. Um, and for example, looking at what is the energy usage pr profile when you're running? What's the energy usage profile when you're in the middle of a break? What's the energy usage profile when you're actually down for maintenance? And typically there are some interesting things revealed from what are the expected sort of energy usages in those different operating modes than, than there are. And that, again, that's another byproduct of, uh, of having a, a trained predictive model about, about your uh, energy consumption. And then after getting the kind of the long-term uh, actions coming out of the, the model training, including the benchmarking, which I didn't mention, is, is really being able to benchmark across similar processes and similar assets across potentially multiple sites, who's the best uh, energy consumer for different, different products and so forth. Um, you deploy that in real time and then monitor monitor the digital twins based on what their expected normal energy consumption is. And then when the expected normal energy consumption, their deviations from that, that produces anomalies that can be acted on in the short term. Maybe, you know, when you, when you go down, you, you're supposed to shut something off and someone forgot to shut that off. Well, that's going to show up as an anomaly as a uh, high energy consumption you know, higher than normal energy consumption and alert someone. And then someone can take action based off of that. And so here again, we have long-term and short-term actions that are coming from the use of the, the predictive models. And so that's, that's kind of two very different but, but similar in process uh, use cases that are applying predictive models and how you can get both long-term and and short-term gains out of that. The last thing I've mentioned here on this on this particular use case of energy usage is is around that benchmarking data and really the the ability to to uh, quickly answer the questions whether whether it be coming from the finance team or whether it be coming from an R&D or product development perspective 
or whether it's from an operations, an operations management perspective, to understand what are our normal energy consumption for different types of, the, of processes within the, within the business with, with different products and different sort of operating, operating modes. Having that, the answer to those questions in what we call a curated data set, it's really the result of modeling producing a set of energy benchmarking data that has been fully modeled, fully filtered, fully um, validated, that then can be exposed through, through um, your favorite business intelligence tools, whether that be Tableau or Power BI or Spotfire and others, so that the, the finance team and others can get, have easy access to this, this valuable benchmarking data to help make long-term long -term decisions and, and, and so forth. And um, the same may be the case for downtime data, if you're trying to make capital decisions, for example. But we found this, this energy data is, is, uh, is particularly useful to have this sort of curated benchmark data set that accurately describes your uh, energy efficiency at, at a pretty fine grain resolution across, across all your assets. So that's really it for me. Um, I'm happy to answer, answer questions at, at the end, perhaps. And then um, I'm going to turn it over to Ken, who's, who's really going to talk about, from an asset perspective, you know, how do you take the results of these predictive analytics and develop the right processes that, that uh, maximize your, your asset performance? All right. Eric, that was great. I, you know, and working in the the paper industry, you know, anybody who works in the paper industry knows that you know two of your leading um, drivers around cost are um, breaks on paper machines and high energy costs. So, you know, those are two great use cases for using predictive analytics. So, what I like to focus on is um, kind of the other side of the the house, the maintenance reliability side. So, I'm I'm I've been in maintenance reliability. You know, over 30 years of my career, uh, a lot of that time was spent in the paper industry. I love the paper industry because it's um, it's got a lot of everything. I mean, it's got you know continuous process. It's got discrete manufacturing. It's got you know big energy. So it's it's really a you know a great place to learn. Uh, what it certainly was for me. So I like this this picture up here because it shows kind of the old and the new, right? You got old paper machines, and you know the, the mill I worked in had was a, over 120 years old. So you know, we were still using paper machines built in the 50s, um, right up to you know brand new technology, you know brand new paper machines, brand new you know biomass boilers. Um, but I think what I found when I got in the paper industry is you know even though we've got a lot of new technology, you know we're still doing a lot of things kind of in an old way. So that's what I kind of want to talk to you guys about today. So I'm going to talk a little bit about asset performance management. Um, you know, if you'd asked somebody 10 years ago, they would have said, what is that? I don't know. I never heard of asset performance management. If you Google it now, you'll see, you know, about a wide variety of different definitions about what this is. Um, so I thought I'd come up with the, you know, the definition, you know, from a, a known source, the Gartner definition is, you know, essentially asset performance management is encompassing the capabilities to capture data in an integrated way, to be able to visualize that data, um, tie it together. Um, and it includes concepts around condition monitoring, predictive forecasting, and predictive analytics, um, and asset management, asset strategies, which is like asset or reliability center maintenance. So, you know, I, I worked in a paper mill, right? So I, I saw every day the challenges uh, from the mill side, right? Uh, safety and environmental concerns. You know, those are always of utmost concern. We, you know, we talk about it daily. You know, we're always, you know, focused on what, what can we do better? How can we get better at safety and environmental? Um, you know, they, they used to always tell us, you know, we only make money in the paper industry on the, the last two days of the month, right? So if you don't run well, you know, you don't make any money, right? So it's you know, very tight margins and you have to really run well. So, you know, meeting mill tonnage commitments is huge. Um, 
ever decreasing maintenance budgets. You're always asked to do more with less. You know, let's get you know more output, but we're going to have to spend less on maintenance. Um, constant regulatory compliance from a variety of sources. Um, trying to maintain a storeroom with you know constantly being asked to to reduce the levels in your storeroom. So it's really critical to know what you needed to have in that storeroom. Um, and just like Eric said, you know, reducing energy usage. You know, running a, a uh, integrated pulp and paper mill um, uses a tremendous amount of energy, just like a lot of a lot of industries. So, you know, when I when I think of these challenges, I can't think of anything better than a reliability process that touches almost all of these things. Right? A, a reliable plant is a safer plant. You know, it helps you get your tonnage. It helps you reduce your maintenance costs. So it helps you with all of these aspects but you have to do it in a very integrated way. So then you look at the corporate challenges, right? Corporate challenges, and you see this all the time, right? I've actually experienced one. You know, we're constantly seeing acquisitions and, you know, this, this company's buying, you know, this mill or, or this company. So you're, you're constantly going through this state of acquisitions. And what that turns out, at least from the maintenance and reliability world is, you know, you, you lack maintenance and reliability standards across the mills. Right, so you got every mill kind of doing their own thing. You end up with a plethora of reliability solutions, right? Um, and something that we we saw, and I think it's not unique to the paper industry, is you know we were losing domain expertise, right? We we a lot of our you know expertise is is retiring, and we just didn't have the you know we had some gap in hiring for a while, so we just didn't have that expertise. So again. APM and tools like this allow you, particularly if you look at um, what Eric talked about, we can gather that domain knowledge and put it into software so that it, it, it's retained as, as we start to lose our experts. So this is what a lot of, um, and it's not just in the paper industry, I think this is maybe, you know, it goes across the board. Like in this role that I'm in now, I see a, a, a lot of different types of plants. You typically see, okay, if you're lucky, all the plants might have a standardized maintenance system. Maybe it's SAP or Maximo or uh, JD Edwards. There's lots of lots of different maintenance management systems. So if you're lucky, there's maybe one across, but with integrations and, and acquisitions, you find that sometimes you're dealing with two and three and four different maintenance systems even across your enterprise. Um, same with the historians. A lot of times it's the same, but a lot of times you're dealing with different historians. But this is what the landscape looks like for a typical um, a typical plant, a mill. Um, lots and lots of point solutions, right? You've got a you've got a tool to help you manage your your mechanical integrity or what we call tank integrity. Uh, different condition monitoring solutions. You have you know some tools that help you do reliability analytics, uh, root cause analysis. You got yet another system to help you with your lubrication management, uh, operator rounds, and mobile data collection. And what you find a lot of, I used to always say, if they took Excel away from us, you know, the whole mill would shut down because we did everything in Excel. So what happens with Excel is, one, we turn our engineers into junior programmers, right? So now they're, instead of, you know, analyzing data, they're building software. And when those experts leave, when that engineer decides to take a new role or, or take a new job somewhere, the, the whole application dies because nobody knows how it works and they don't know how it was developed and you're starting over. So, you know, you really have to think about things from more of an enterprise wide when you start thinking about reliability. And that's where uh, APM and particularly uh, the GE APM solution. Um, we implemented this at the, at the company that I worked for. Uh, we had tremendous success with it. We had um, something that looked just like this. We had lots and lots of point solutions, lots of spreadsheets, lots of different, you know, sources of truth. And what we were able to do is we were able to integrate all that into one seamless solution. So it integrates with um, one or many multi, um, CMMS systems, uh, multiple process historians, condition monitoring solutions. But the crux of the tools are all the same. They all come with an APM solution. So it helps you do everything related to your asset performance process. All the tools are built in. It can integrate with the external data sources as it needs to. And like Eric was talking about, it's, it gives you the capability to see all your mills at the enterprise level. 
it helps you standardize. Kind of rushed to do this a little bit because we've got um, we're a little bit limited on time. But what we saw with it was um, it allows us to have one single source of asset hierarchy. So what you don't want, and what you typically get with a lot of point solutions, is you have duplicate um, hierarchies about your equipment. So you got different ways to represent your assets. With an APM solution, you use the you have one standard registry of assets, and that typically comes from your SAP or Maxima or whatever your maintenance system is. So a good APM system like the GE APM system is going to inherit that. It's going to synchronize with that. So all the work that we do is on that same hierarchy. Then it drives standard work processes around those those assets, right? That you can't do when you're when every mill is doing its own thing. You get the visibility across the enterprise. So in a lot of cases, we're seeing less resources at the mill level, and we're seeing more corporate type resources that are overseeing the governance of maintenance and reliability. And this gives those professionals the, the, the view and the enterprise look so they can see what all the mills are doing. They can compare, hey, why is this mill much better at maintaining and getting reliable um, the vacuum pumps where these others can't, right? So you can start to see those those differentiations and it's scalable so as you add add mills to your system it's just a matter of putting their data into the system um, it's cross board so it scales very easily uh, reporting is standardized every every mill is not coming up with their own way to measure things and our you know generally it people love it because instead of maintaining 20 or 30 different applications you're you're looking at just you know one or two applications And I always like to say this, that, you know, so software alone is not going to do it. So great software is, is certainly a key component, but it's the work processes in the people that make it work. So when somebody talks about APM, it's work processes, it's the people who are trying to implement those work processes. And then on top of that, it's great technology like APM and predictive analytics. And I'll kind of leave you with, with kind of a visual here. but this is the work process for for a good asset performance management system you start with criticality you understand the criticality of your assets not all assets are graded equal then you develop strategies around those assets and a good apm system is going to help you decide what the mitigating actions should be i'm not going to get into detail because we're running out of time but these are the typical types of buckets of of mitigating actions that you need to have in place to make sure that your assets can perform good compliance actions, good inspections, what are the operational folks doing? Um, what is, how does the capital uh, engineering get involved? What's our spare parts plan? And then we execute on that plan. We take those, those actions that come from our strategy and we implement. Some of those are gonna be operational, some of those are gonna be related to maintenance, and some are gonna be related to, to capital engineering type work. On the back end, we review that data, and that's where the analytics around um, that Eric talked about, you know, those are giving us data real time, telling us what the condition of and health of our assets are. You know, our assets can't raise their hand and say, hey, I'm not feeling well today. So that's where software comes in. It's able to, to look at all the, the, the things that are going on with these assets, and it raises the hand for them, right? It raises the hand and says, hey, I'm not feeling well today, and what are we going to do about it? So. So we can respond to those deviations and the software has given us more and more and more time to um, address those issues and to be able to, to, to mitigate the, the effects rather than letting things run to failure. And then on the back end, we have some tools that help us you know, really look at our, our measurements across the enterprise, perform root cause analyses, share those results with, with all the mills and constantly updating our, our strategy. So, you know, what kind of benefits can you see from things like predictive analytics, from, from implementing an asset performance management system? Um, these are results that come not from, you know, necessarily from the work I've done, you know, at, at the mills, but across a number of customers in oil and gas, uh, pulp and paper, power, uh, chemicals. Um, you see reductions in inventory costs, right? Not having to carry so much um, spare parts in your storeroom because if you're not having the the downtime events you might be able to optimize what you have in your storeroom 
you know, certainly increased availability, getting more, more throughput, more tons out the door, you know, reduce, reducing reactive maintenance. I think what we found when I was um, working in the paper industry, um, once you get your costs down to where they need to be, what you end up doing is instead of spending your money fixing the same equipment over and over again, you take your maintenance resources and you apply them proactively. And that creates this, this virtuous cycle where things get better and better when you're when you're spending your resources in a proactive way rather than in a reactive way. Okay. Um, most companies are seeing, you know, safety and environmental incident reduction, you know, employee gains and certainly around the IT costs. I apologize, went through that fast because I want to make sure we have some some time for questions. So I'm going to turn it back over to Jeremy. I think he's going to either reach out for some questions or. Yep, absolutely. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Eric. I really, really appreciate it. Great presentation. Ken, um, uh, just a question we got here for you. you. You were talking about equipment criticality earlier. So how do you how do you determine if predictive analytics are you know what's needed for a particular type of equipment? How do you how do you make that assessment? Um, because like you said, not everything's created equal on the plant floor. Well, with, there's a number of different ways with, uh, to, to evaluate criticality of assets. Um, one thing you can do is depend on what the manufacturer told you. So what, what you need to do is you look, need to look at the asset in the context of your operation. So you might have the same pump in four different spots within your, within your mill or your plant, and it's in a highly critical uh, area for one application and the other three maybe it's spared and it's it's less you know it's it's going to have less risk of of failure so um yeah, generally though there's a, a few things you look at you look at you know what would happen safety wise if this piece of equipment was to fail is there an environmental hazard that could happen uh, is it going to cause a significant production loss or a significant cost so those are usually the four parameters we look at when we're analyzing criticality for for assets. And then based on that, that's what determines what level of rigor we put on our asset strategy. For highly critical things like turbine generators, we're going to put a highly rigorous asset strategy in place. For equipment that's, you know, you know, fairly low criticality, we're not going to put nearly the amount of effort into that because it doesn't have the same amount of risk. And Ken, what's involved in doing a pilot or, or assessing uh, for someone who's interested in, in APM? Well, I, I would start small. I mean, there's a lot to APM, right? If you look at all the things in, the, in my diagram here, um, you know, there's a lot to, to, to digest there. So I would say, you know, start small. I, one of the things that we did um, that was really effective was we implemented a um, operator-driven reliability program. So, you know, we took what we, you know, getting our operators out in the field with, with uh, mobile devices and collecting that that condition and um, um, equipment related data in a, in a in a way that allowed us to take action on it. That was something that was you know very digestible, something we could get started with pretty easily. So that's that's one that's one area I think you get started pretty pretty easily, and then kind of move into some of these more significant areas. Great, and, and kind of in the same vein, uh, someone was asking Eric. You know, how can you assess if you have the right data to start pursuing, you know, a solution based in predictive analytics? That's a great question. Um, one of the drivers of us creating this concept that I talked about earlier, this model factory and the level of automation is, is, to, is to be able to answer that question quickly um, with, with actual data and to not spend a bunch of time or money only to find out that you really don't have the right data. And so um, typically three months worth of data and you know, a number of examples of something you're trying to predict in, in place is, is what you need. Um, but again, our, our advice is always let's, let's get connected to the data we can use our model factory to automatically assess what's what's the quality of that data and what is its predictive power and do that very quickly at low risk is, is, is the, the typical approach. And Eric, I think you, you find uh, the, 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 Go ahead, sorry. 
I, I was just going to say, you know, we, we in the, usually in the paper industry and probably a lot of, I'm sure most other industries, we were data rich. We had lots of data. We just didn't have a lot of information. We, we didn't necessarily able to combine it in ways to, to give us the insights. And I think that's what, that's what I like about what Eric's talking about. It's, you know, providing practical tools to put that power in the hands of your, your technical guys, right? Instead of them having to develop great spreadsheets, you give them tools that allow them to analyze this data more easily. Yeah, and that's what I was going to ask, uh, can you anticipate My question is that you normally find that companies, you know, have that three months uh, ready to go. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, you know, we, we had such great, you know, you know, time series data. I mean, we had, and we were, where I worked, we were a fairly older mill. We had some, a lot of older equipment and, and some very new state-of-the-art equipment. But I would say that we were data rich. We had lots and lots of great operational data, uh, even you know, great maintenance and event-based data. It's just tying it all together is tricky. And that's where these tools help make it all work together, right? Great. Ken and Eric, thanks so much for taking time today uh, to talk with us. Uh, great presentations. And I just want to let everybody know, just a reminder, uh, you know, the session is recorded. We'll make it available and we'll follow up uh, with an email to everyone. So if you want to get into a deeper conversation uh, with Ken or Eric, you know, we can set that up for you, uh, you know, at any time. So thanks for the questions, everyone. Thanks for being on early and staying staying through. And again, Ken and Eric, thanks so much uh, for the presentation today. Hey, you bet.